Hello everyone, my name is Alexei Leonov and I am the first man on the moon and I'm of course from the Soviet Union and this is a Soviet rocket using UR-700 spacecraft. Welcome to What The Math, today we're going to be talking about a mission that could have happened in a parallel universe where the Soviets were the first on the moon. And hello everyone, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a mission that could have taken the Soviets to the moon before the Americans. Now, you're looking at a recreation of UR-700 rocket, and UR stands for Universal Rocket. Now, this is a Soviet rocket that uh, was actually developed by a team... Uh, under Vladimir Chelome. Now, he was actually not as famous and not as popular as Korolev, but his team was responsible for developing a really, really famous rocket that is still in use today called the Proton Rocket. And you'll notice that there's a bit of a similarity, if you actually know what Proton looks like, there's a bit of a similarity between this version and the modern Proton version that you see on the screen right now. Now, uh, this actually is a very early design and it actually never really got to fly or to be launched uh, to space, but uh, nevertheless, there was a very high possibility that the Soviets could have been first if it wasn't for bickering and for political games that the Soviets were famous for. Anyway, so we're going to launch this rocket and see how it, got, it does. We're going to try to go to the moon and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this mission as I go along here. And this is going to be a real launch, real time uh, launch and I'm not going to be pre-recording this as I usually do. And the thing is, uh, what I wanted to do is actually test this, uh, this design because I actually don't really know if it will be able to reach the moon. This is the first attempt ever so here we go, and three, and a two, and a one, and launch. Uh, Soviet launch of the UR-700, um, designed by Vladimir Chelomey. Now let's actually talk a little bit more about the actual mission and, of course, uh, the person himself. Now, uh, what's really interesting is that um, back then, so there were two major um, rocketry teams in the Soviet Union. The, the first one was the more successful one by Korolev. He was responsible for the R-7 rocket and for basically launching Sputnik and all the major launches. But there was also a team by uh, Chelomey, and he actually had a slightly different approach. He deci decided to, um, on his team, he decided to actually accept a lot of members who were um, kind of affiliated with the Soviet party. And be because of that, he was actually able to advance himself quite um, quite high, and he would have actually been more successful than Korolev had Khrushchev not actually been deposed off. And uh, basically because uh, Khrushchev was no longer in power and because... Oh, let's actually do this first. Let's separate our first stage. And now... First stage separation. Um, and uh, yeah, because uh, uh, Khrushchev actually lost power and um, uh, Chelomey had a lot of Khrushchev um, members on his team, including his son, uh, he was no longer actually in favor of the Soviet Union uh, or Soviet Union didn't actually like him as much anymore and because of that he didn't really get as much support. But uh, this rocket was actually a backup plan for the N1 rocket by Korolev's team, which was supposed to basically launch uh, the first Soviet team to go to the moon. Now you'll notice that this particular design actually has quite a lot of stages, and this is actually very unusual for the Soviet rockets because it had the boosters, then it had the first stage, uh, second stage, and then they had the third stage, and its second stage actually uh, received a lot of fuel from the first stage from the boosters, and then there was another stage here, and there's more stages on the inside. And the interesting part about this particular rocket is that on top of all of this, it would actually be assembled in a vertical position just like the American rockets and not like the Soviet rockets. So this is actually very unusual for the Soviet designs. And uh, this would also would have been the largest rocket ever constructed, even larger than the American Saturn rockets. Um, and so had it been successful, it would actually have been able to establish quite a lot of various records. And I think uh, it's very unfortunate that this rocket didn't get to fly back in the late 60s. But um, as the Proton uh, rocket is essentially derivative of this, we do actually get to see what um, came out of this design after all. 
But uh, just as I was saying before, so Krolov and Chelomi, they were actually um, direct competitors with each other. As a matter of fact, they had an internal moon race going on. Um, and Chelomi proposed uh, that this rocket could actually launch not only a single man um, craft like the Krolov team rocket. And let's actually just separate this first. Look at this beauty. Beautiful separation. And launch our last um, circularization engine here and try to get into circular orbit. And so this particular design could actually take up to seven people uh, to the moon. And uh, because this rocket more par was more powerful than N1 design and even than the Saturn design by the Americans, it would actually uh, be able to deliver something like uh, almost 150 up to 250 tons of uh, material to the orbit around Earth and then obviously to the moon as well. And the main advantage of this particular design was that you could actually assemble all of these parts separately back in Moscow and then transport them by train to the launch platform, whereas the N1 rocket unfortunately had to be assembled on the spot, which is why it was more expensive and more... Uh, more difficult to assemble and more difficult to actually maintain as well, because it was actually a very much more expensive design than this particular rocket. And the most important part was, of course, that uh, this particular design only used 12 engines, whereas the N1 rocket had something like 42 engines, which is a lot more expensive, a lot more difficult uh, to create, and also, obviously, a lot more dangerous as well. And as we, or as you may have uh, read before, or as if you have, may have watched in previous videos I made, um, the N1 design actually uh, created one of the most... Um, most impressive explosions, non-nuclear explosions in the world when it actually uh, was not able to unfortunately take off and uh, destroyed itself on the launch, uh, launch platform only 30 seconds after the launch. And now that we are in space, we can actually uh, release our uh, protective layers here. We're going to do this, and we're also going to release the ALS, the um, the really, really important part that I'm going to talk about um, in one of the future videos, because launch escape systems uh, on any kind of capsules are ridiculously important. So anyway, so let's open the uh, craft here and release the system and there we go so that's our lander right here inside the rocket and we're now are going to circularize our orbit and then release this part which will go to the moon now the other interesting part about this particular design is that um Chalamet was actually working on several parallel designs at the same time using a similar sort of launch um platform and a lot of his designs would be ridiculously um successful had he actually been given a green light because he was planning to send another rocket to mars another rocket to venus and uh, because uh his designs were theoretically theoretically possible uh they would have actually been the first to reach other planets as well uh, but unfortunately, like I said before, Kurlov was chosen over him, and so his N1 rocket was where Soviets decided to put all of their money and uh, the rocket that they decided to pursue in order to try to launch the first manned mission, um, manned mission to the moon. Okay, we're only a few seconds away from our circularization maneuver, and we only need to burn our engines for 12 seconds to circularize. And um, what I wanted to say is actually a little bit more about this engine. Now, uh, this rocket, uh, uh, its third, uh, third and fourth stage would actually use a revolutionary nuclear engine. Uh, so powerful, as a matter of fact, and so efficient with fuel that it would, would have been actually used on many rockets afterwards. Uh, but since this have, n rocket never really got to fly, we'll never know how successful it was. But uh, this particular engine would have been called R031 nuclear engine that would have been actually able to... Um, burn uh, cryogenic liquid hydrogen or liquid methane and develop quite a lot of thrust for the third and the fourth stage which would be responsible for transferring the craft to the moon or to other planets and then also slowing down before the landing. Alright, so now we're in a slightly more or less circular orbit. We can actually try to plan our maneuver uh, and try to transfer to the moon. And let's actually see how this craft does. And this is all um, my first attempt, actually. So I don't even know if I have enough fuel, but luckily uh, the Kerbal Space Program allows us to see that using Kerbal Engineer. So... And had Cholomay's team been successful in developing this particular mission, the way they would have done it is by transferring directly to the moon's, moon's surface without really circularizing around it first. Now, the Apollo mission actually did circularize and then the craft would return to orbit and proceed back to um, Earth. But here, this is actually where th uh, this particular mission differs from both the 
and one Korolev's mission and the Apollo missions is that it will be a direct transfer to the moon and then direct launch and return back to Earth di uh, basically directly. This is how powerful this particular rocket was that it would actually be able to do that quite easily. And we're about to start our um, transfer to the moon. Now we're going to be doing it uh, just like Chelomi intended. We're going to be basically transferring directly there and uh, not going to do anything else except for the suicide burn. It's going to be a relatively challenging maneuver, but it's more fun that way as well. And now the um, next stage, the fourth stage actually doesn't really have a very powerful engine, uh, but nevertheless, we will be using a combination of this to slow down and this other part that has a slightly a smaller engine underneath, underneath to land on the surface of the moon. Now, while we're actually doing all of this, let's uh, maybe talk a little bit more about uh, Chelmi himself. So uh, he was actually a very prolific um, space engineer, uh, even though he wasn't really a space engineer originally, but he did create some incredible ICBMs. Now, he was actually responsible for some more advanced ICBMs in the Soviet Union and obviously in Russia. And he also invented a Pulse jet engine that was uh, kind of uh, the um, the jet engine used in certain aircraft and certain rockets. And it's a very interesting sort of a jet engine to look into because it's a very unusual but very uh, efficient design. He also was uh, the uh, first person to uh, um, ever conceive and also create uh, an anti-ship cruise, uh, cruise missile. So basically all of those cruise missiles that um, Russia and China have now, all of them kind of were created by him as well in a sense because he was the first to develop this concept. All right, looks like our transfer to the moon is complete. We are going to be landing on the surface of the moon and we can now enjoy the escape from the Kerbal uh, uh, gravitational influence, body of influence and transfer to the moon. Uh, so this is the part where we could have actually separated the stage, but we're going to use it just as it was intended to slow down um, before we get to the moon, even though we don't really have much Delta V left in it, but it's enough for us to give us that extra boost. And then we'll see how it goes when we actually get to the moon itself. Now I'm, I'm going to warp to the moon so that we can actually advance this a little bit. And uh, let's start calculating our approach here. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, I haven't really done this yet, um, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, I'm guessing it's not going to go too badly because this is not a super difficult maneuver, but nevertheless, things go wrong in Kerbal Space Program sometimes, and so we have to be careful. Um, I'm kind of warping a little bit too much here, but you know what? It's okay. It's okay. We, we can survive. Oh, too much, too much, too much. We can survive if something goes wrong. Now, is this too fast? Yeah, it's definitely too fast. Uh, all right, so... Turn around, retrograde boost, full speed ahead. We need to slow down as much as we can. I know my uh, smaller engine has like five minutes burn. So that means that um, I'm going to have to definitely be a little bit more careful here. So, all right. So let's lose all our speed. We're going to lose um, as much Delta V as possible using this bigger, more powerful engine. And then we're going to separate it right around here there we go and now we're going to engage our next stage now this takes five minutes to burn and i believe uh we are about three minutes away from the surface so that's uh maybe pushing it a little bit too much but we'll see how it goes let's release our gear because i always forget to deploy gear and uh if everything goes right we should be landing on the moon um safely and if everything goes wrong then i didn't save my game i may have to restart the video from scratch but anyway so um what i really wanted to do here is just to uh, recreate uh, this particular design and just to see how it actually would work in real life especially because 50 years ago um in february of 1966 uh, and today i'm making this video in february of 20 2016 50 years ago this is when luna 9 actually landed on the moon uh, and uh, was essentially the first soft landing on the surface of, a, um, of another object in our universe. And it's actually a pretty big date when you think about it, because until until that date, um, the only the landings that we had were hard landings. We, we were able to crash aircraft, we were able to pass by different um, planets and moons, but unfortunately we were not able to land on them. And Luna 9 actually was the first to successfully uh, soft land on... Um, 
on on a satellite but uh not a really a planet that, but that's you know what that's still very very impressive all right so what i'm looking at here is this i'm looking at my suicide burn distance and i'm also looking at my suicide burn delta v and sun has gone um be, uh, behind the horizon here so we're going to slow down just a little bit because i don't want this to be too much but i also don't want this to go too low i did i was able to slow down quite dramatically actually so i can actually now do this a little bit um slower so we'll see how i can actually land here and the problem with this landing is going to be the fact that i'm not going to have my shadow here to try to estimate where i'm landing and also because we're going to be in the dark we're going to have to wait until uh, the sun the sun comes up to take some really nice pictures, uh, but uh, landing here in the darkness is going to be really challenging. All right, we're getting close to the surface here, but I really can't see anything because it's so dark. So I'm going to have to use my um, my flight engineer here to see where I'm landing and what's going on. But I do, do see the mountains, so we're definitely below some of the mountains here. But uh, what I wanted to talk more about is, of course, well, first of all, I'm using a mod here called Soviet Probes and Soviet Engines. And this is actually the engine that I'm using here. It's um, going to be my last stage. And this has Frigate on it. I don't know if that's what it's called. I think it possibly is called Frigate. And, um, ooh, too much. Too much. There we go. Let's slow down a little bit more. Uh, okay, we're still not there yet, though. Okay, we're gonna go at, um, I think, about 5 meters per second now, just to be more real, uh, make this more realistic. And uh, hopefully we have enough fuel as well. Now, so, as I mentioned before, this particular rocket then led to the development of uh, the Proton uh, rockets. And the Proton rockets are very, very successful and very famous for being able to launch super, super heavy weights, or I guess heavier than usual, um, onto really, um, really high orbits. And um, Proton rockets are still used today, um, and uh, they are actually probably some of the more successful heavy launchers ever created. And uh, the interesting part about Proton rockets uh, that is that they're actually not as famous as uh, the Soyuz rockets, but they're probably more important because they're able to launch a lot more and uh, quite, um, quite cheaper as well. And um, I believe the last Proton um, launch was as uh, as early or as late as uh, January 29th of 2016, which is only about four weeks before I'm making this video. Uh, so there's quite a lot of launches per year and uh, they're actually used by many different countries to launch their satellites into uh, geostationary or even higher orbits because it's probably the more efficient and the more cheap way of doing it. All right, so we're kind of getting close to the surface, but it, um, I don't think we're there yet. Let's actually see how, there you go, altitude 230 meters. Slowly closing, closing uh, to the surface, even though we cannot see anything. Once we land, we're going to advance time and basically wait until the morning because I don't know where I am and I do want to take some pictures here. Uh, so we have 160 meters left, uh, just enough fuel to land safely, and we're going at a speed of about 4.3, 4.2 meters per second. So we're going to have a very, very soft landing here with a carbon in the background. Okay, 80 meters. Let's actually increase this a little bit more. 70 meters. And look at this beauty. This is actually a pretty cool, pretty cool shot right here. If you don't mind me saying so. And we're about to land, I believe. I don't see the surface, but I'm sure it's coming. 30 meters. We're going at just over one meter per second. A super, super safe landing here. And there's the surface. I can kind of see it now. And turn off your engines now. Yay! We've landed. And oh, we're tipping over. No, don't tip over. That is not good. And mission success. Unfortunately, we did kind of tip over and we're able to actually reestablish our uh, balance. But uh, I did lose one of my parachutes to the... Uh, to the fall. Uh, so anyway, so let's actually return back to Kerbin now, um, and uh, let's stop right now. There we go. We're now on the surface of the moon. There's the sun in the background, and we can actually see where we are. Look at this beautiful plane we are, we're in right now. Uh, we're going to get out for a second and plant our flag. Let's see. Bill is going to be our first man on the moon. First Soviet uh, astronaut on the moon is Bill Kerman. Or is he better known in the Soviet Union? Uh, Billy Kurmanov. 
Okay, Billy Kermanov, let's place our flag right here. You're so happy. So happy to be here. Let's take a, a, a sample. Appears to be radioactive. Interesting. Let's keep this data. And plant the flag. Um, and this is basically the end of this particular mission. We're going to still return to Kerbin. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, make it back and see how my return uh, module works. And here we go. First Soviet astronauts on the moon by Bill Kerman. Uh, let's get back to the spacecraft. And it's actually, as you can see, it's not as small as some of the other uh, moon landers I've made previously, but it is definitely a little bit different. It's actually, um, I kind of like the, how it actually looks. If you look from a distance, it does have a really cool, oh, good job. Good job, Bill. You fell down on your face on the moon. Uh, it does have a really kind of a cool design. Now, um, it's a little bit different from what uh, Chelomi actually was uh, planning. His design was a little bit, um, I guess, a little bit more wide. And I tried to recreate this as best as I could, but unfortunately I couldn't find the necessary parts. But I think this is a pretty good uh, copy of what he was planning to do. Let's just grab this and get inside the uh, spacecraft. All right, so we're ready for the next part. And uh, what we're going to do is transfer all of the remaining fuel back into the original tank. There's nothing left here. And there's a little bit left here. So we're going to transfer that as well. And I'm going to actually combine these two into one stage. All right, so... Where am I going? I'm going back to Kerbin. Where's Kerbin? Kerbin is there. Okay, cool. So we're going to go... We're going to go... I think it's 90 degrees. Is it 90 degrees? Yeah, around 90 degrees. And uh, let's see how this goes. Where is 90 degrees? Over here. I'm going to try to eyeball this. This is all manual control not pre-recorded in any way and ready and steady we're going to separate this stage this is going to stay behind just like it was intended by chelome and this stage is going to fly back to kerbin and three two one and let's go something exploded i hope it's nothing important uh actually i kind of wonder what it was but anyway let's go to 90 degrees i think it's right here and there is our lander left behind and so this is the stage that's going to be returning back to Kerbin. We're going to try to um, eyeball everything, not use any maneuver nodes or actually we might have to use one maneuver node. Uh, but uh, basically the return to Kerbin is going to be direct. We're not going to try to reestablish orbits here. We're not going to try to get into any circular orbits around uh, either um, the moon or Kerbin. We're just going to go directly back home and then land using the remaining two parachutes. Unfortunately, third parachutes was lost when I flipped over my craft by accident. And so there is our first landing si site for this particular craft. And we just passed this ridge right here, which is a crater of some sorts. And we can now uh, try to blast our engines directly toward the horizon and uh, use all of our engine power to try to escape the um, body um, or the sphere of influence of the moon so that we can actually return back to Kerbin. And I believe my burn has now officially been complete. I have a really, really nice intercept with Kerbin at 23 kilometers. Perfect. Uh, and so now all we have to do is just wait for us to get to Kerbin. And then we might as well just actually release this part. We don't really need it anymore. But we're going to do it closer to Kerbin just in case we need to uh, change our orbit or change our um, course a little bit. So just for now, we're going to keep this. And uh, let's actually accelerate time advanced time of escape from the moon and uh we are now on the return trajectory to kerbin all we need to do now is basically land safely but because i'm missing one of my parachutes that was originally here i don't know what's going to happen we might actually end up crashing so we'll see how it goes and here comes kerbin we can actually now technically release uh, the last part which i'm going to do right now and so let's actually just decelerate a little bit there we go and uh, move toward retrograde so that we can actually prepare for the descent. And so that's it. Uh, looks like the mission is almost finished. Uh, everyone is hopefully going to be returning safely back home. And we'll see where we actually end up landing or possibly crashing. And as we're cruising toward Kerbin uh, atmosphere, we're going to actually realign ourselves with the retrograde vector, because this is the important part. We don't want to uh, destroy our capsule while, while we're actually descending. 
And you can kind of see the engine burning right there as well. This is the engine that just separated a few seconds ago. And there it goes. That's why I decided not to keep it, because I knew it was going to explode. And three times even, not even once. Now, our speed is actually still over three kilometers per second, but we are slowing down dramatically. And I'm pretty sure we'll be fine as long as we don't deviate from this particular um, retrograde direction. Uh, but uh, I'm just worried about having only two parachutes, but as long as we land in the water, which I think we are going to be doing, we will we'll be fine. If this was land, maybe we might actually not survive, but because this is water, we, we, I think we'll be, we'll be okay. And looks like we've survived the re-entry. We're now just going to be cruising down to the lower atmosphere and uh, releasing parachutes when we get to... Uh, velocity of below uh, 300 meters per second. It's going to be a, a few more seconds before we get there and we can kind of see the clouds already and it looks like yes it's going to be water landing for us which means that we should be fine. We should be okay. Now original mission uh, actually was very similar to this. Um, it, it would be a direct uh, return to earth and then this type of a capsule would actually release its parachutes and the astronauts would actually land uh, on the land, uh, not really in the water, uh, the original landing was actually intended for them to land um, somewhere in the forests of Soviet Union. But unfortunately, since this mission never really um, materialized, we'll never really know how it was actually meant to be. Now, the thing is, a very similar design might still be able to uh, launch um, astronauts in the future uh, to, uh, to go to Mars, of course. And the Russian uh, space agency, along with the European space agency, is currently planning to establish a colony on the moon and they're actually actively planning it uh, and somewhere before 2030 they have actually have officially um, agreed to to uh, make it happen so uh, there might be another launch similar to this particular rocket that would actually commemorate uh, Chilome's advances in rocketry as well that would be launching um, an actual colony to the moon which would be pretty awesome uh, we still don't know what kind of a rocket they'll be using, and we still don't know exactly how they're going to be building the colony, uh, but it, it's been officially announced that it's actually in planning. Uh, NASA is not really doing anything yet, but the... Oh, wow. Okay, we're going to be landing sideways. Uh, but they might be actually making uh, or developing their own mission that we don't know anything about yet. But they are definitely planning to go to Mars at some point. It's been announced that they are planning to... Um, get to Mars and that their future plans will be all about colonization and uh, exploration of Martian surface. Alright, so we're almost home. Unfortunately, we're not landing in the right sort of direction or um, using proper orientation, but that's okay. Just going to accelerate until we definitely land in the water here and there we go. It's going to be a splashdown at seven meters per second. We could actually have survived this, although since we're landing sideways, we may have actually destroyed this capsule if this was land. All right, excellent. So everyone outside, or at least you, go outside and take a swim. Anyway, so um, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about in this particular video. I hope you enjoyed this video. And basically the idea here was to kind of explore a little bit of the potential missions that could have taken the Soviet astronauts to space but of course, due to the various political games of the Soviet government and the uh, competition between Kurlov and uh, Chilome, unfortunately, this rocket never really made it to the space and never even made it to the launch pad. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's a pretty cool design. It's definitely a design that could have uh, helped Soviets become the first on the moon. And it's a, ooh, wow, I'm underwater. And it's definitely a design that I kind of wanted to recreate in Kurlov Space Program. Thank you so much for watching, hopefully you liked this video, and if you did, like it and share it with your friends, and don't forget to check out some of the other Kerbal Space Program videos that you see on the screen right now. Thank you for watching, game you later guys, and as always, bye bye.